Welcome and thank you for listening to our brand new podcast, Talking Automotive with Mark and John. This is a podcast for people in the automotive industry. My name is John Sinclair. I'm a senior automotive executive with experience working around the world and my co-host, Mark Palavestra, an Australian automotive executive with experience in all areas of the business, including sales, after sales and remarketing of vehicles. Mark, welcome to the show. Hi, John. Thanks for having me along and looking forward to this uh, this series that we're putting together and adding some value to the automotive industry from an open dialogue perspective. Uh, with your experience, uh, my experience, you know, we're talking uh, you know, 39 years plus each. So we're, uh, we sort of know a little bit about this, uh, this very, very dynamic industry that's going through a lot of change right now. So uh, yeah, I'm very keen to share some insights, but also have some really good guest speakers on board to add value to this industry and also talk about some pretty serious topics that are impacting everybody, whether they be customers, dealers, supply chain and OEMs. So a lot of people uh, that really uh, are key parts of this industry. You know, this is our first podcast, a brand new podcast. Maybe it's worth just sharing a bit of your background, what you've done in the past, where you're based. So just to give people a bit of an idea of who you are and so we can get a bit of a feel for, you know, what you enjoy and, and what you do. So, Well, John, uh, for those that know me out there, they'd know that I started out as a, a tech. You know, I'm a car guy. I love cars. I grew up in a country town, dreamed of running away and joining a Formula One team. That was always my goal. Uh, I got to work in a, a multi-franchise dealership up on the border in uh, Victoria, New South Wales. And then I uh, moved to Melbourne and pursued uh, my dream of being involved in a race team. And I worked for uh, the Holden dealer team, special vehicles and building cars and got to do one Bathurst, which was a bit of a buzz. Uh, other than that, uh, joined General Motors because you know, I was very passionate about the Australian auto industry. And, and you know, Holden had been market leader for a long, long period of time. Also spent time, a brief moment, doing a, some remarketing before joining GM. Uh, went, spent some time in Mannheim, it was Fowles back in the day. And, uh, you know, learning about how that whole used car market works and the whole remarketing of uh, company cars, government cars, repo cars, damaged cars. It was a real huge eye-opener for me. And then working 17 years in GM after sales, then in sales and else like commercials, SUVs before SUVs were a happening thing. So just seeing, you know, getting on the start of that. Uh, and also learning the B2B space and B2G and the different sales channels and even things like the rental market and, and having extensive roles across all of those. And then moving into two OEMs and having the opportunity to grow a business that was at a, a, a nexus, if you like, uh, joining the team at Renault and uh, being the sales director there for uh, seven years. That was a, a really fantastic journey. And then uh, joining uh, the FCA group as the sales director too. So this is where it's been a fun business to be part of after sales, sales. Formula One cars are still a bit of a passion for me. I must admit, I've the fortunate opportunity to drive one uh, back in 2012 as part of uh, the Renault business, which we were heavily involved. So that's, that's my uh, bucket list. One, one thing ticked off in that, at least, anyway. And John, tell me about yourself. You're an international man of experience, not an international man of mystery, but an international man of experience in the auto business. So can you tell me a bit about you? Yeah, Mark, it's a bit scary. I've been a long time in automotive, so more than 30 years now. So I started as a management trainee with Nissan back in South Africa. I was involved in, in those days, you spent time in every part of the business. So we spent time in after sales. I worked in trucks, sales, finance, so every part of the business. My main forte is setting up and managing Franchise networks, set up a franchise network for Alfa Romeo's, involved with Fiat in South Africa. And then I was fortunate to spend six, seven years in Europe, also for Nissan, uh, working in the Nordic. We were based out of Finland, looking after Nordic countries and Baltic states. So really tremendous time. And since then, I've had a fortunate opportunity to come to Australia and been involved again in the automotive market here. So currently, I'm busy with two exciting projects. I'm busy establishing Madeira. It's an automotive software company that started in Europe, and we're now establishing that in Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa. I've also been working for the last couple of years on a very exciting project. I'm assisting uh, some guys to take a diesel and fuel injector to market. The company is called RK Lab, and they're pretty close now to actually launching the product. And it's going to make a huge impact on emissions and that. So, so we're pretty excited about that. So I'm looking forward to continuing my work in that area. I really enjoyed it. It's You meet the most amazing people. I've had opportunity to deal with fantastic operators and that all around the world. Learned a huge amount. 
and really passionate about it and, and still enjoy talking to those people. We often keep in touch and they contact me from time to time and it's great to see them and watch them growing their businesses and that. So good to have the show and I look forward to having good conversations with you. So John, would you say that the auto business is a people business? I think any business is a people business, Mark. I think business is about relationships. It's, about, it's long term. It's about relationships. And that's why you see your successful dealers are the dealers that are well entrenched in their communities. They're part of the golf club. They're part of running the local council. They, they're always talking to their customers. They take interest in their customers and they're friends with their customers. And I think that's really important. And I think that's what's the success of any long-term business. You can do short-term things. You can be lucky and make some short-term money in that. But I think you eventually get found out. So That's a good point. Mark, I've had a lot of people asking, why are we doing this podcast? What is the background? And what do we want to achieve from that? What's your view on where we at, you know, and our approach to the podcast? Well, the key for, from my perspective, John, and this is what we've, we've chatted, is that we want to keep it informal, but we also want to keep it conversational. Many podcasts can, can be very rigid and, and very stark in how the information gets shared. Others are very, very casual. We want to keep ours conversational, but still have valid information with key guests. Yeah, Mark, I think the key there is just trying to provide some in-depth analysis. And maybe from that, we can learn from this and learn from speakers out there and share this knowledge across the industry and help people sort of manage through this COVID-19. Now we're in COVID-19 here, so we, we normally would have filmed this together, us sitting by a fireside and having fireside chats about this, about this very key subject. Now, we can't do that. So you've got your fireplace. Can you tell me about your uh, your background? So I've just got my fireplace in the background here, but uh, I'm not sure fireplaces are the right thing for Australian climate because I think it can get pretty hot here in the summer. So I think we might need to change our pictures in that once we get into our summer months in it. Maybe we can have a, a beachside chat. That would be fantastic. Well, I don't mind uh, travelling and uh, given that I can't get out right now, uh, I've just got a shot of the bun back in uh, in Shanghai. I was there uh, last year on uh, on vacation with my uh, with my family. So that's today's backdrop. I'm sure I'll have something else different. I might have my kitchen next week. So let's just get out while we can, even if it's uh, virtually. Okay, good, Mark. So today we've got some interesting topics to talk about. I think the the big curveball is COVID-19. So, so I think it'd be good to chat a little bit about, about that and then get an understanding of what, where do we go from there? How do we come out of COVID-19 and how best to address that? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the other thing also we're keen to talk about is you know, just where the market is uh, and what do we need to do collectively as an industry and and whether it be REM, also the dealer network, how do you prepare? What are the next steps from here? So what are the drivers of the behaviours and, and the results? And then what do we need to do collectively going forward? Because where are the opportunity? Meet the market, you'll win. Okay, that sounds great, Mark. Let's dive into our conversation. I'm looking forward to that. Mark, it's, it's a really tough time for the industry at the moment. Uh, we're seeing... All businesses under a huge amount of pressure, uh, both from a financial point of view, from a stress point of view. Uh, you know, I think it's really important to say we actually really feeling for businesses out there at the moment. Uh, we hope they can manage to navigate through this COVID nineteen and successfully come out at at the other end. Uh, it's really important. Um, it's good to, to have everybody find a way to get through that. So I, th I think firstly, I just want to reach out to you and say so we are thinking about them. Oh, I definitely agree and concur with that. The fright from the OEMs, which is such a challenging job to forecast. You would never have been able to forecast for this. Everyone would have thought this year would have been a, a better year than last. And to have this come at you uh, at this time is just really frightening and horrific. And we definitely feel for all the guys uh, out there and the dealer network. It is such a tough time to be a, a car dealer right now. You've had two years of, of declining profitability and, and a market that is just changing and has fundamentally shifted. And we really feel for uh, all the guys in the network, whether it be sales after sales, the parts people, uh, the pre-delivery people, the used car guys, it's a really tough industry to be in right now and we feel for it. Absolutely. COVID-19 presents a whole new world of challenges for everybody. Customers, dealers, supply chain, OEMs. The industry is going to change. There's no doubt about it. 
the industry here in Australia was going through significant change already. And we've seen, you know, the market's been a million cars for the last 10 years, a few little up, uh, bumps along the way, but a million plus, 1.1. So this year, last year, I just made a million. This year, we'll struggle to make a million. And this massive uh, shock that we've seen with COVID-19 changing by behaviour firstly, but also manufacturing's changed because supply chains are going to be, well, the factories have stopped. And it'll take some time for these factories to ramp up and they'll ramp up for their home markets first. We don't make anything here in this country anymore. All the local manufacturing's gone. So when we looked at the GFC, the plants would have been idle, but then they would have come back on stream fairly quickly. We had local plants that then supply the Australian market. Here, we don't have that. So some brands will be stronger than others with how fast they can ramp up and get stock to the country when the demand comes back on stream again. We know the Europeans have longer supply uh, lead times as to the North Americans. Uh, the, the key winners will definitely be those that have supply chains that are shorter that can ramp up and get product here quickly. But that's only just one element. There's a whole other element of buyer behaviour. Who's going to buy? What are they going to buy? When are they going to buy? How are they going to buy? How are they going to fund these things? And how are they going to own them? Do, do they want to own them or is ownership something that's going to continue to decline as we have the generational change coming through with Gen Ys who don't buy new cars like Gen Xs and baby boomers did in the past. So there's lots of things that are about to happen and this COVID-19 bump in the road is going to shake out a whole heap of different behaviours which we need to see and get some key opinions as to what those behaviours will be. Yeah, I think it's pretty scary, Mark. This COVID-19 is a real curveball coming in and it's uh, it's impacted everybody in the business through dealers, OEMs, manufacturers, uh, even all the, as you say, the supply chain guys and people in insurance, finance. So it's it's pretty scary. And how, there's, what really struck me is how quick it came in. So there was no time to prepare. So if you're running at the at the real end of your business and pushing hard, there was absolutely no time to prepare. Do you have any ideas in your mind of what people can do at the moment to try and get through this, specifically looking at dealers? Yeah, it's an interesting one. The, uh, I suppose the, it gets back to what, if, if you go back to what the one-on-ones of, of this business are. Customers come into dealers to buy cars, OEM supply cars to dealers through various supply chains, shipping, uh, the PDIs at the ports, et cetera, and get the vehicles through. We had a lot of stock coming in to Australia where all the OEMs were very confident and bullish that there had to be a rebound. March saw 24 months straight of decline in the auto industry, 24 months. So that's the market system has been adjusting down since 2017. It's 18, 19, and we've just seen now 20. It just kept moving down and down and down. And this is a bigger shock in a market that was going through a longer term correction. Now, that longer term correction, what was causing that? And this is where there's been a lot of conjecture around uh, pre reported cars and the deal network. Now, what we've seen is with the move with the FCAI earlier this year to change the reporting rules, and there's still a lot of pressure from the VACC to change the reporting rules, that we've seen these inventories of pre-reported cars dropping across the board. Some brands are still a bit uh, aggressive with it to push some inventory through, and that puts pressure on the dealers to have that stock. But in the main, that pre-reported stock has started to come down, which is a good sign. Businesses have been cleaning up their... uh, and they've been they've needed to do that because profitability has dropped. The downside of that is as that stock clears and there's no new stock arriving, when it ramps up to get to uh, have demand again, that there'll be a gap between old inventory before the new inventory can, inventory can turn up. So as with all the recessions, if you look back over the journey, when supply has stopped, if you age stock, age stock will clear because it does clear. And then there's a gap between the new stuff coming in. There's going to be a lot of curveballs also with exchange rates and pressures around exchange rates. So plants can get up to speed to supply their domestic markets before they go to an export market like ours. And then what are the uh, cost opportunity or challenges for those same products coming into Australia? 
So right sizing and cleaning up and getting the house in order is critical. And this is where if you look at uh, some of the great car sales data, where there's the listings for demos has actually increased, where they're, they're clearing out a lot of those pre-reported demo cars, good value time for customers to buy vehicles. Going on from that, it's the uh, challenge for the OEM centre to, to get the business back or eat the market back or meet the market to the right sorts of levels. So these are the opportunities right now, get the house in order. And a lot of that's already been happening. Just didn't have, what hasn't helped is this absolute stop in people coming in to buy cars. Because what the behavior that has changed is mobility. And the need for that mobility right now is we're not allowed to go anywhere. So therefore you're not putting kilometers on your car. The last thing you're thinking about is actually getting another car right now because your car is not really a problem. On the flip side, and there's good to see some good car sales data, is that people are actually still searching online. So there's the behaviour of changing, of, of, of taking some time out to actually look for a car, not necessarily going out to buy it straight away, but now this process of consideration is, is bigger because people, consumers have time to look online to see what's, what's out there. And this is where the digital presence is so critical. The digital story from the OEM to the dealer and the customer journey from when the customer goes to the OEM's website, dealer's website, the car sales listing, and any other channels that they use to list their media, list their vehicles, it's critical that the message remains consistent. You don't have one price here and price there and a different information there. Customers get confused. and it's, well, What do we do here? What's, what's really going on here? So the digital journey is a critical piece. And the other part that's so important is the uh, response times. There's plenty of time to, people got time on their hands to go do some inquiring online. If they send inquiries, it's that whole get onto that lead. Should be within 10 minutes, preferably. Now, some brands have a two hour or four hour uh, KPI to respond, but it's getting onto those leads really quickly and then just having that conversation with the, uh, with the prospects. So these are some of the things that are happening as far as people having time online, but then they've also got the opportunities to uh, actually interact with the dealership because we will, the market will come back. It won't stay like this forever, but it will be different. It will be different. Mark, you spoke about uh, cars in it uh, being the shortage of cars, but there's also going to be a shortage of parts. Do you think this is going to have an impact and do you think this is going to have an impact on servicing of vehicles? Uh, and how long do you think that will, will be across the industry? Servicing, I'm actually from a service background. I started in this industry uh, as a technician on the floor. So for me, it's the, the love of, of cars and uh, what makes them work mechanically is amazing. And service has always been a very resilient part of the business. Service is a grudge expenditure. No one sort of brags about, I can't wait to go get my car serviced. Uh, but it's a necessity that you have to have done. And that's why obviously these free service programs or uh, cap price service programs are so critical to keep the cost down. But service is a must. And this is, and, but uh, what we know is parts can get here quicker than say an automobile. So there, if there's a shortage globally, then there's a challenge from the original OEM, from the original source plants. But the beauty with parts at least, you can get them in quickly uh, with air freight, more so than you can move cars in and out with uh, very slow uh, ships that will be full and, uh, and, ch and challenging to get spots on those ships. Yeah, it's, it's a really good point that it's, you know, so there's going to be less impact on servicing. There's going to be more impact on, on shortage of cars and that. So, so that's probably going to have uh, push your used car sales and, and push that side of the business. Where do you think the opportunities are for four dealers and OEMs short term? And you're spot on, John. We, we saw this with the GFC. Uh, used car prices drop right about now. Everything drops because demand drops away. And it's that lovely nexus of supply and demand. When one moves, the price point. Now, there's one-on-one one -on -one economics, supply and demand. You know, supply shifts, demand shifts, your price changes. So right now, demand has dropped right away because no one's driving. No one's got money. Everyone's concerned about their financial state. So the first thing you do, you 
you batten down the hatches and stop spending. But that doesn't stay last forever. So what we'll see now is a short-term drop in used car prices. But getting back to that whole supply thing again, once the demand kicks back in again, supply will be constrained and used car prices will go up. Good quality, low kilometre used cars will always be good news. The other challenge that we've seen in the last two years, as the new car volumes have dropped, low kilometre used car prices have remained very strong. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Traditional short cycling has slowed as far as the not-for-profit organisations, even the rental car companies. Demand for those vehicles uh, is, is still quite strong, but there's not enough supply for them. The rental car market used to be around about 50,000 cars a year. That's how many used to go through that short cycling space. It's actually increased. It's increased over 60,000 now. So that's still not a lot of cars in a 1.1 million car market. So the perception is that there's a lot of rental cars. There's not. There used to be a lot of government cars, and the government are actually very, very good at buying cars. Some of the best fleet managers in this country are actually government fleet managers. The government does not squander money on cars. They are very efficient, and they are highly accountable for what they do. So what they do, they buy safe cars, environmentally friendly cars and cars that are very good from a fit for, fit for purpose perspective. So those cars are good news as used cars. Sadly, the, mark, the private buyers have access to those vehicles when they get auctioned off. So the auction prices for those are quite strong because people realise that they're the only cars you can get that are low kilometres and still have significant warranties on them. The shift to five-year warranties, I believe, is starting to slow that short, short cycling as well. Because previously, when you had a three-year warranty, uh, if you short-cycled a car after two years, you still had one year of warranty to on-sell it with and give some peace of mind to those customers. But now, with five-year warranties and our <coughs> seven-year warranties, keeping a car for five years makes a lot of sense because you've got coverage, you've got peace of mind for any hiccup, you've only got the cap price service to worry about. And the cap price service programs are really good news for consumers because you know what your costs of ownership is going to be all the way through to five years and you've got warranties so you're not going to have any nasty mechanical expenses to wear. So this is where the used car side of it will show that those used cars will still prop up quite strongly because there won't be a lot of, new, of low kilometre used cars coming back onto the market. So those cars will be strong and this is where the demos will clear and the demos will still be fairly strong. Not as, as strong as a new car, but still as uh, it'll be, they'll be seen as a very good value. But the opportunities there is how can you generate used car stock that is two years old, that has, uh, is, is still in very good condition? That's the opportunity in the used car space. Mark, if you're sitting as a dealer now, you've buttoned down the hatches, everything's cut back, you've got your staff working at, at your service Workshop is working at 50%. Most of your sales guys are sitting at home working remotely. And how? what are the practical things you should be looking at to put in place, eyeing that once they start to ease restrictions and we start to get out of COVID-19, start getting slightly more mobility, what would be the things that you would put in place to make sure that you could best optimize that time when we start to come out of COVID-19? It's interesting. Uh, I remember my first role uh, in a sales role, and it was actually uh, it's back going back to the the nineteen eighties, and the first training program that ever. And it's funny how certain things just stick. The key was make a list, and this is it's that one hundred and one. It's it's the database of who do I need to work, and just really working those databases, engaging and having a honest conversation with those prospects and customers, existing customers and prospects, working them and then working them and communicating A, or firstly digitally, because that's the soft intro. So you're sending out your emails, you're doing SMSs, you're sending out EDMs, you're using social media, get those contacts working. Secondary one, secondary one is, the, is, the, is the, the, the voice calls. Just having a touching base, but not 
to sell a car today, because those days are gone, I want to sell a car today, it's I'm starting the process. I'm going to put in a pre-season, in a sporting term, putting in a pre-season in to get the engagement with these clients because once, if you have enough conversation with them, those balls will start to drop. So engaging, whether it be even service and after sales, it's the same thing. You need to be having a conversation with them that you're here, you're open, and it's and it's really good to see those dealers that are proactive on uh, LinkedIn and other and other other social media with their customers, just letting them know, hey, we're here. These are some of the services that we offer. Having that conversation, having a really good website, and having value in that website where people come to and actually want to have a look to see what you've got. Other other social media that you're putting out there as well. They want it to be very part of that community. So these are the key elements that they've got to start in readiness for when the market kicks back in. Those that are just sitting and waiting and waiting for the market to kick will be left behind. So the proactive people digitally, because right now plenty of everyone's got time to do digital and everyone is killing that time by having a look to see what's out there. And if you're popping up, even though they may not need a service right now or you're popping up, they don't need a car right now, but you are still appearing and just showing that you, uh, you're, you're there, you're open for business, these are, these are the things that you can offer. When the penny drops, if they need something, oh, I saw an ad from John. John was doing this in the community. He was there when times were tough. I'm going to go see John. And by the way, John's been communicating with me as well, so it's easy for me to go straight to him. So from a from a stock perspective, would you as a dealer be ordering stock at this stage or do you think it's too soon or would you be holding fast to making sure that things are definitely picking up? And that's both for parts, used cars, new vehicles. Uh, where would you need to look at that? Is, do you think it's a big risk to start looking at stock and how you you stocking? No, not at all. I'd be looking at my, always be looking at my stock profile. Uh, looking at what I have in stock, what sells, what doesn't. I'd, I'd have my sales history obviously there. Now, this is different going forward. Like uh, you, would, you would assess where you're at versus your normal rate. You would then look to see your, your profile, what are, the, what are your age cars, all the, all the basics of inventory and still doing a forward availability workout, plugging in numbers. You need to be forecasting what those numbers will be. It's tricky. It's really tricky to see what, what the next couple of months would be, you, but you'd still need to make sure you have a plan to have a supply of inventory that you know you can confidently sell. You'd probably be more conservative with what you're, uh, what you're ordering, but you'd want to make sure you've still got something. Because the worst thing that can happen is that you don't have anything, that the V-shaped recovery, if you look at the Westpac and also National Australia Bank are forecasting a V-recovery, we had a V recovery back in 2009 with the GFC. Uh, the government had a, got the stimulus packages going. The economy kicked straight away. So rather than a, a double bottom, we just had a straight out V, up it went, and then it just the trajectory continued on for until 2019. So we've, we've been pretty strong uh, as a result. The, the drop has been very severe in the economy. The volumes have been dropping, obviously, from an automotive perspective, but this April will be a big drop. May won't be as big as last year, but then May, June, peak selling period. If it doesn't come on board, those cars that would have been purchased in May, June have to be purchased at some other point. They will kick in towards the back end, I dare say. So you'd still want to make sure you've got an, uh, some form of supply line, uh, line that's coming through. You wouldn't be... Uh, outrageous. Some some may be bold, and uh, and if you're bold and you, you're looking at what what products are conservative products that people will need, and if you, if you look at uh, things like the supermarkets and you know, the basics of toilet paper going, there's a run, there's a run on toilet paper. There's a run on pasta. All the all the very uh, mainstream products that you just take for granted. Is this the time that high end products? maybe contract, but your mainstreams are stronger. That's yet to be seen. But usually in, when times are good, risks are taken. When times are bad, consumers go to more conservative. 
So this may be an opportunity for the conservative, uh, for the for the more mainstream brands to actually have uh, somewhat of a, uh, a success. Yeah, I think it always depends. Your ability to be proactive depends on your your cash flow, your strength of your cash flow. So the more cash flow you got, the more you've got a better ability to take some risks and and get some get some stock in. But that's that's. Uh, it's something you're going to have to look at and, and look at the strength of the business to be able to do that. Mark, you mentioned in the beginning about the changes in the industry. You said things are not going to be the same again. What are the two things, two or three things that you think are definitely going to be different going forward? Well, it's interesting. Whenever you have, and this is this is something that it's 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 a it's an old. Uh, uh, could be said to be cliche, but you learn good habits in bad times and bad habits in good times. So when you had the market booming from 2013 basically through to 2017, a lot of the industry players fell into, well, the, the market's that strong. It doesn't matter if I do this particular behaviour. I have that, a little bit of a heavy stock or if I, if I just if I accept the... You know the lead responses at being a day or something like that, or two days. Now that sounds really. Some people say, "Well, what the hell are you talking about? A day or two days?" Well, we've seen data with uh, lead management systems where you know, leads aren't responded to within a day, twenty-four hours. And then when consultants are challenged as to why didn't you sell a why didn't you sell a car to that person? Oh, by the time I spoke to them, they'd already moved on. That's because they weren't weren't rearing to go. You weren't you weren't hitting them when they needed to. But these are the bad habits in good times, and you learn good habits in bad times. This is when you're talking about the the changes will be what are people buying? It'll there'll be more of a reliance on online and digital, more so than ever. I think the key learning here, and this is where you know, everyone's been spooked. You, know, you go for a walk and you, know, you, you, you deliberately don't want to get anywhere near the other person who's walking across, you know, coming at you the other way. That behaviour will stick around for the short to medium term because, you know, this is a decade that's going to be a decade of pandemics. You know, this decade, the 20s, is going to be a very unique decade. So digital is going to be a critical piece of how you tell your story, how you respond and how you communicate. And that's the critical num- number one piece. The other bit is that digital follow-up and engagement with those customers. A lot of dealers, good dealers are doing it now, but there's still a hell of a lot of the network that's still not. And that's going to uh, really shake out the, the really good, the successful guys from the not so successful. you really got to be engaging all the way and be relevant. Because as soon as you're relevant or you're just sitting back and waiting, you're going to miss out. And sadly, that's going to be uh, a tough pill, uh, pill for many to swallow. Hmm. Mark, the, in terms of dealer profitability, at the beginning you mentioned the, the challenges we're having with the market coming down. And that's going to probably be a really important part going forward is how dealer, dealers manage their investment, their return on sales, what they're doing in the business and that, because I think that's going to be really important for a business uh, because I think they've realized the risk if a pandemic or something comes along, how exposed they are. So I think people are going to be a lot more conservative and a lot more careful in what they're doing. What's your view on that for after the pandemic? Oh, it's definitely a, this one is, is so unique. If you look at all the recessions that we've had over the journey and, you know, I remember the, uh, I, was, I started in the industry at the 83 recession we had and the 90 recession we had to have and GFC. Now, we've, we've been fortunate in this country. We haven't had a hell of a lot. But in all of those recessions, you could still get out and about. There was still the opportunity to move. What you were limited to was your access to funds. So basically, they were all uh, based on uh, available credit problems. If you look at this one, this is a behavioural change. This is where behaviour was mandated that you couldn't go out and do certain things. You couldn't go spend your money. And if you look at any chart, whether it be sales volumes or walk-in traffic or any, any sort of product information, anything, any, any volumes over time, it's measuring human behaviour. 
human behavior to buy shares, human behavior for exchange rates, human behavior for volume of cars sold and test drives, et cetera. So human behavior has been significantly changed by what the government mandated. And no one could have foreseen this, that the government say, you're not allowed to go out. Therefore, you don't need a car. Therefore, you don't, you're not spending money, which then slows all parts of the economy and basically contracts it immediately. So I think given that we're potentially going to have more pandemics, global travel has opened all this up. The reason why we, we, we're feeling this more so than SARS and, bird and uh, swine flu, et cetera, is more and more people are travelling globally. It was like 37 million flights last year. So what we're seeing is that the opportunity for these pandemics to spread quickly is exponentially increased from 10 years ago, 20 years ago. So there's going to be more of these things, more of these things that we have to be prepared that, okay, if we have another shutdown, what do we need to do? And, and what are the plans? You, need to have, you actually need to have a pandemic plan for the next time that it happens because it will. We will have another one of those. Okay, Mark, we've had a really interesting discussion today. I think it's been interesting things have come out in the topics. Uh, I think to give a final wrap, can you identify the two or three key things that have come out of our discussion today? Well, it's interesting, John, because uh, the three key elements that come into play here is if you look at the channel specifically from a dealer perspective, it's the 101 stuff. It's the really focusing on costs. If revenues and incomes are constrained because of the behavior of customers not coming in, it's really focusing on getting those costs down. Inventory is everything and inventory planning, but also making sure you've got a plan going out of this because you need to still have a horizon more than just the current month. So really being focused on that inventory, the forward availability workout for your vehicles, new, used and also the parts inventory but also that used car opportunity specifically we know from all other recessions when you come out there isn't a supply of low kilometer used cars and this is something where car share can present an opportunity or even some of these dealer-based rental programs to create some inventory and there's some products out there that can help you with that and we'll have that, some information at future future podcasts on that and how you can actually do that but used car supply line the second takeaway is your digital footprint what are you doing right now to make sure your digital story, because if people are coming, if they're spending their time online, they're looking at social media, they're looking at all of the different elements. You can't just be one dimensional. There's LinkedIn, there's Facebook, there's Instagram, there's TikTok. So these are the ones that you really need to make sure that you've got a, and even Twitter, that you're still exposed in all of those channels. And the third one is to make sure that you've actually got a marketing plan in play now. The biggest risk is that you shut up shop totally and don't do anything. There are cost-effective ways and it links into the digital side, but also even just engaging in your local community. The local IGAs are doing very, very well right now. And the community is hurting and the community actually is open to people to be engaging with them. So this is where really making sure you embed that local area marketing uh, and start that process now. Be online, still be visible where people can get to because once they come out of their shells, because everyone wants to get out of their shell, they'll want to come back and they'll engage with the first people that they can see that have been there all the way through this journey. Because we talked about that as far as what are the winners going to do? The winners are going to be planning now. They're going to be actively marketing now. They'll be relevant from a social media perspective. So they're the three takeouts for me. Have you got anything that uh, you want to add to that, John? No, the only thing is, Mark, I'd like to say thank you very much to everybody for listening. Great to have you with us. We're going to be posting this podcast every week. So if you like what you heard, it will be great if you follow us and we can notify you of future broadcasts. And give us feedback. Are there any topics you'd like to hear? Are there any issues you'd like us to discuss? Uh, uh, we'd love to hear your feedback. Hope to improve as we go. This is the end of our first brand new podcast and we have enjoyed sharing our information with you. Thank you very much.